Welcome everyone and especially to our speaker Mario Cepeda Cáceres. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Latin American Anthropology Seminar is a forum for anthropologists and um, for scholars who are conducting ethnographic research in Latin America to present their work. It is hosted by the Institute of Latin American Studies at the University of London. And uh, this year being online means that we can have speakers from around the world, as is the case today with Mario, who is based in Peru. We are three conveners who jointly coordinate this seminar, Jesse Esclair at Cambridge, Natalia Buitron at Oxford, at Oxford, and myself, I know Montoya, at the Institute of Latin American Studies. The seminar runs fortnightly on Thursdays at 5 p.m. UK time. And the full program is available on the ILAS website. And you can also follow us on social media for updates. So today I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Mario Cepeda Cáceres. Mario is a lecturer in anthropology at Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú. And today his talk is entitled Trajectories to Understand the Absence and Ethnographic Reading of the Materiality and Intersubjectivity of the Nobody Among Missing Persons Families in the Peruvian Andes. Mario is going to speak for around 30 to 45 minutes, and then we will open it up for a Q&A, aiming to finish around 6.30 p.m. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, please use the raise hand function available on Zoom and I'll ask you to unmute and ask your question. Or you can also post questions and comments in the chat box while Mario is talking or during the Q&A and I will read those out. And we are recording Mario's talk, which we will aim to post on the Institute of Latin American Studies website, but we're not recording the Q&A. So I think that's all in terms of housekeeping. So over to you, Mario, when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you for accepting my presentation. Thank you, Ainoa, Jessica, and Natalia for being here. And thank you everybody to join us uh, this afternoon or night, depending on where you are based. I'm gonna be speaking for 30 to 40 minutes, but I have a presentation in order to be more organized and I'm gonna share it right now. Um, please could you let me know if it's, everything is fine and you can see the presentation. Yeah. All good. Uh, all good, okay, thank you. Okay, as I know I said, my uh, presentation today is titled Trajectories to Understand the Absence and Ethnographic Reading on Materiality and Intersubjectivity. Um, of the nobody among missing person families in Peruvian Andes. This is a uh, this research is part of my um master's thesis that I defend on uh, 2019 and that I'm sharing now with you. Uh, I will um, be speaking about four topics. Two of them are a brief introduction of, on the uh, Peruvian armed conflict in order to everybody to know uh, some specifics, and then I will share my uh, research and findings. I won't be speaking about my methodology since I think that's something that we can talk later or if you have any question later. Hmm. This presentation will explore how missing persons family in Peruvian Andes follow trajectories in order to respond to uncertainty of the body and to build alternatives to the impossibility of grief through what I will call, and you will see, the no body and its techniques. Uh, my first point is the Peruvian internal armed conflict. And I have some um, extracts from the uh, Truth, Truth uh, Commission that are sadly in Spanish. So uh, uh, if it's needed, I will translate it. Or if not, it will, it will be recorded and you can translate it later. So, some facts in order to understand the Peruvian internal armed conflict. It was it developed between 1980 and 2000 and over three governments or three Peruvian governments. On the decade of 1980, it was two democratic governments. And from 1990 or more specifically 1992 until 2000 was one uh, 
autocratic or dictatorship, uh, the uh, government of Alberto Fujimori. The uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission estimates that more than 69,000 Peruvians died during the conflict and that this was the um, deadliest war in uh, the Peruvian history. Nowadays, we know that more than 20,000 people are still missing uh, and this number is uh, growing stronger every day. The uh, conflict started when two subversive organizations declared war to the Peruvian state. The first of them was the Partido Comunista del Perú Sendero Luminoso, also known as Shining Path in English. And the second one, uh, some years later, was the Movimiento Revolucionario Tupac Amaru, uh, or known here in Peru as M MRTA. Uh, and the violence was widely spread through all the Peruvian territory, and the uh, CBR, or Peru's Reconciliation Commission, uh, has established that 24 out of 26 uh, Peruvian regions reported violent cases. On this map, just to, for you to have an idea, and if you don't know Peru, you can see this is the Peruvian territory, and this is the number of deaths and disappearances reported to the CBR by district. Um, the CBR, just for you to know, made their research between 2001 and 2003. Of course, nowadays, more than um, 17 years later, we know more facts and we have more data about the uh, Peruvian internal armed conflict. Nevertheless, the CBR is still at one of the strongest and biggest research about this period. On this map, you can see a red dot or a red arrow. This is the Ayacu this is Ayacucho region. This was the region where the armed conflict started in 1980, and the region where my research is based, and you will see uh, in some minutes. So in this map, you can also see that, as I said, almost all the regions in Peru uh, reported violent cases. Nevertheless, none of them had the same um, incidence of cases. So another, uh, some more data about it. These are the main regions or the main Peruvian regions where the uh, violence was reported. As uh, Well, if you know Peru, you can know that uh, almost all the regions is on this, um, chart are regions where indigenous people live. So this give, give us an idea of who the victims actually are. They are indigenous and peasants. They are the uh, most or the, or the poorest people in my country. Uh, the armed actors, as I said, there are two or there were two subversive organizations, uh, the Shining Pass and, and the MRTA. Uh, also, these state security forces, especially the police forces and the army and the navy, and we all there are also other armed groups, the um, committee, committees of self defense, called here in Peru Comités de Autodefensa or uh, Rondas Campesinas, and two paramilitary groups that they were founded by the um, the government. One founded by one of these three governments that I mentioned before. This is, a, I will stay here for just one second. So you can read the Spanish, it will be perfect. So you have an idea uh, of, th this is a profile of maybe where the CBR on who the victims actually were. But I will, um, almost all the victims were uh, campesinos. Uh, I don't like this translation into rural peasants because campesinos here in Peru have a special meaning. It's not also related to uh, the agricultural world, but it's also related to ethnicity and to special living conditions and historical conditions. So I, I, I use this, this word in Spanish. I don't like that much the translation. They were poor or extreme poor. They uh, speak a language different from the Spanish. They, they have a native, they have an indigenous language. Almost all the victims have an indigenous language. Most of the victims were men and they were between 20 and 40 years. So we are talking that almost a, a two generations of campesinos were, are, were killed during the armed conflict. And the uh, crimes that reported are basically uh, assassinations or they were killed 
they would disappear and women were especially raped. Nevertheless, I say that men are the uh, victims who were almost dead. You can say that if men are dead, uh, women have also another kind of, uh, or they suffer all kind of crime. As I say, they were raped, but they also they have to face uh, the um, conditions where their partners were missing, their partners were dead, and they had to uh, search for truth, for justice, etc. So women have a special condition of victimization during the armed conflict. And this is important. With, with what I will say in some minutes in my presentation. So I, I want you to keep this idea that nevertheless, men were killed, women are actually victims themselves too. Not only because they were raped, but because they had to face or extreme condition, conditions. Mm. This is a, a picture I took from the uh, CBR work. Uh, this was took in a peasant community called Lucanamarca. This was one of the first massacres perpetrated by Sendero Luminoso or the Shining Path in 1983, where 69 campesinos were killed. Uh, they were uh, men, women, and children who were killed by the Shining Path as a statement because this uh, peasant community was the first peasant community in the Puritan who actually made or had or planned or tried to have a rebellion against uh, the Shining Path. Sadly, they didn't success. So the Shining Path made a, tried to make a statement killing 69 persons on this community. And even though 69 uh, campesinos were killed, you can, as I, and I want to mention this again, women uh, had another kind of victimization or other kind of condition they have suffered. As I said, this was one of the first massacres made by uh, the Shining Path, but this is a pattern that will repeat through the, uh, the decade of 1980 by the Shining Path and then by the uh, armed forces and the police forces too. The campesinos were killed by the state and by the uh, subversive group. Nevertheless, the CBR estimates that uh, more than 50% uh, of the victims are Shining Path victims. This, on this chart, we can see the number of deaths and disappearance report to the CBR. You can say there are two uh, peaks uh, around 1984 or 83 and 1991 or 1990. These are, um, the, this chart also shows us how the violence was uh, developed through th these 20 years. It was not, or oh, these 20 years, was, they didn't present the same kind of violence and they didn't present the same kind of incidents of violence through the armed conflict. There was extreme periods and they uh, the, this internal war and internal conflict had different um, spaces that we went through. I won't mention them because it's not necessary for this presentation, but we can also find more information online. Another Spanish quote. I just stay here for a second so you can read it or try to translate it if you if you want. What is important with this idea is that uh, the profile of victim of, of the internal conflict victim is the same profile that historically has been made to the most uh, vulnerable people in Peru. So uh, we can't tell, and um, nowadays we are sure that um, this was not a peasant revolution, the, or this was not like a civil war, and the Shining Path and the MRTA were not peasant movement or pe peasant uh, revolutionary revolutionary movement, because actually campesinos were the victims of their actions and the victims of the state action too. And uh, it's sad because the most vulnerable people in Peru was also the uh, victims of the armed conflict. And this will also characterize the answer that the victims have on the transitional period uh, starting for 2000 and nowadays. So now uh, I want to think about uh, Peru as a 
post-conflict society. And even though the CBR or Truth and Reconciliation Commission had a special chapter and a special mandate on reconciliation, uh, what I want you to understand is that reconciliation is not only a goal, but it's also like this, uh, how, how can I tell you? Uh, something hard to think and to debate in Peruvian society. And I will try to show you why this, I, this is more like an idea than actually a process that we have achieved so far. Peru have the four pillars of transitional justice. So, uh, all transitional justice theory state that in order to uh, have a transition from a violence or a dictatorship to a more democratic society with uh, the rule of law, we need, we need these four pillars to be developed. Uh, truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees of no repetition. And Peru have presented all these four pillars. Nevertheless, as you will see in a minute, Peru is not a more fair society. We don't have a better state. We, we are not like a reconciliated society. We, ha we have on the pillar of truth, we have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This is number one. You can see the former president of the CBR uh, with the um, former president Alejandro Toledo. Now he's uh, the former president Toledo now is prosecuted for corruption. On the second pillar, we have justice. We, uh, there has been some waves of justice in Peru with um, criminal processes, but sadly, almost all of them haven't finished with um, any kind of condemn to um, the military or to the uh, revolution, uh, sorry, um, the uh, shining paths of MRTA. Justice is more like a process that actually a result of in Peru. It's really hard for victims to actually reach some kind of uh, legal justice or criminal justice in Peruvian justice system. We also have a big reparation process. Nevertheless, it's a slow process with a lot of setbacks, especially political setbacks because the uh, democratic governments in the last 20 years, since we recovered democracy, they don't have the same goal on reparation. They don't have the same interest on in reparation. And so the reparation process and the reparation policy has, has been shutting down several times on the past 20 years. And basically it's because the uh, political actors that were uh, uh, active during the armed conflict are still active in political life in Peru. Uh, Alan Garcia was present between 1985 and 1990, and he was again present uh, between 2006 and 2011 in Peru. So you can tell that some of the uh, leader or political leaders that has certain mm, in, special interests on the past are still active and they are still have a special political power in Peru. And finally, uh, on warranties of no repetition, when we talk about warranties of guarantees of no repetition, we are basically talking about uh, a state reform. What should we change in the state in order to guarantee that this free period of violence and dictatorship won't repeat again, won't come again, come, won't come again back? But um, the proven state is an inefficient state. It's a bureaucratic state. So certain reform has been done, but not all the necessary reform has been done. Nowadays, we have a more, or we thought that we have a more prepared uh, police forces and armed, armed forces because they have went through a strong human rights pro, uh, program of uh, education. But on the past five years, uh, new evidence of violence from the state, the state to the uh, civilians has been shown. And I want to share that with you next. Uh, as I said, nevertheless, we're still a fragmented society. This is uh, this picture from September, 2007 and December, 2020 is their picture from a memorial site here in Lima, which is called El Ojo Que Llora. 
and it's the oldest memorial site here in Lima. And this site has been uh, vandalized or attacked on several times and on several occasions through its history. Uh, on September 20, uh, 2007, it was vandalized with uh, orange um, paint. Orange is the uh, characteristic color of uh, Fujimori's party, which uh, or who was a strong uh, party on the last 20 years, even though Fujimori was a dictator and Fujimori is in prison. The Fujimori family and the Fujimori's party are still pretty active on uh, political life. So in September uh, 2007, the, this memorial was attacked with orange paint. And why? Because on September 2007, uh, Fujimori's trial started. So it was an, uh, a statement or a symbolic statement. Also on last December, December 2020, again, the, um, memo this memorial was attacked on December the 10th, the Human Rights Day, this memorial was again attacked. On January 2021, just two months ago, uh, you can see this picture that is uh, said Terrorismo Nunca Mas, which is, uh, uh, you can translate it as uh, ter ter terrorism never again, or not, not any more terrorism proof, which you can uh, actually think that it's a, something good, right? Because nobody wants terrorism in society. But this statement has been appropriated of us, has been took by uh, conservative groups and uh, neo-fascism groups. And so, so they have a special meaning. This uh, phrase was written on a sidewalk next to the uh, public ministry in Lima just two months ago. Why? Because on this special, uh, on this sidewalk, um, a memorial was built to, for two victims of uh, uh, police violence. So, and so they were like uh, popular heroes because these two young guys died. But the, um, this conservative group actually attacked this, this memorial that was on the street and they destroyed it and they, they wrote this uh, phrase, Terrorismo Nunca Mas. Why? Because you know, on a proven imaginary, uh, anybody who's actually from left or have some left-wing ideas, it's immediately, immediately a terrorista, it's immediately a terrorist. As I said, we have also a uh, proof of um, police violence in Peruvian society. On April 2015, this picture was took and actually was a re police repression on a manifestation. But what is uh, characteristic of this picture is that um, actually this person who is being arrested by the police, it seems like he has a grenade or some uh, violent artifact on his hand, but uh, then we knew that um, actually this artifact was implanted on his hand by the police force in order to create false evidence. On November 2020 in Peru, we have a, what we can call a coup. Uh, the president was uh, impeached in, on an express impeachment and a right-wing conservative uh, party took power. So uh, citizens went to the streets in order to process, to protest, to recover democracy and it was faced with a strong political repression. This picture was really famous because you can actually see the uh, Peruvian police pulling out a Peruvian flag from the uh, protesters. No? So it's really strong as a, sim as a sign or symbol. And on, again, on January 20 2021, we have this picture that actually this person who is shooting is a um, undercover police officer and he's shooting to a uh, protest to civilians in, and he's not even shooting to, to the sky, he's shooting straight to civilians. And uh, this was also a really strong picture. It showed that we actually can't talk about reconciliation or even makes us wonder if we can talk about transition in Peruvian society. Knowing all this and knowing all this context, I want to start going through my research because it's important to know the context in order to understand the results of my research. So uh, on this third um, point, I will try to show us or I, I want you to understand with me the uh, what I call the uncertainty in the Peruvian Andes. And I think I still have time, right? So I, I'll go. I have this chart. Uh, actually, this chart 
was made by me during my research process and it helps me and I think it will help you to understand my own research. I, um, I understand death as a, as a level of certainty. When someone dies, uh, their relatives, their families, their friends, know that this person is gone and it's gone forever. So we go through a grief process and what in um, anthropology we call a post-liminality uh, mo moment. But when a person disappears, this certainty is gone. Uh, it starts an uncertainty moment or what I call an uncertainty moment because on disappearance or on forced disappearance or I, I just talk about disappearance, um, uh, families, relatives, friends, we are not sure if a person is dead or is just missing. Uh, we can't go through a grief process or as, uh, understanding grief as a ritual process. Why? Because in Western societies, as well as in the Andes, uh, this uh, grief ritual needs the body, right? You uh, have a memorial service for the body, you bury the body, and then you visit what uh, symbolized a body on a cemetery or whatever this person is buried. But without a body, the grief ritual can be even started. So the relatives and families and friends are on a liminal moment. And uh, anthropologists, we know that liminality can be really powerful, but nobody actually can live on liminality forever. So I have this, uh, idea and I have this theory that on disappearance another process starts what I call the no body techniques and I will show what, what I mean with the no body techniques and the result of these techniques is not a post liminality moment where the result of this technique is some kind of resilience moment that try to be like a post liminality moment but it's not exactly the same so the uh, I, I like to use this idea of Isaiah Perez Rojas, which is mourning remains because grief as a ritual can be started, but the mourning process can be started in a different way. What I have haven't researched so far is what is under this second um, red line and it's the exhumation and reburial process. I have no doubt about it. So I, I, I know that uncertainty operates on the exhumation and reburial process but I don't have enough data to actually know if this means a post-liminality moment or it means a resilience moment. Why? Because uh, on my interviews with uh, relatives, they always mention that even these relatives who, are, who have uh, reboreal their missing person, they still think and they still feel that uh, their loved ones are still missing. Why? Because they don't or they didn't recover a body. They recovered certain parts of the body. They recovered some parts of the clothes, etc. And when they reburied a missing person, they, uh, usually they reburied it in a small uh, children coffin, which is more like a symbol than actually a proper reburial in uh, Western societies as well as in the Andes. So my research goes on this. Um, level of disappearance and this is what I will try to show you what I'm trying to show you on this presentation. Uh, the nobody. The nobody is a process in which the absence of the materiality of our body does not mean the absence of a intersubjectivity process, a intersubjectivity relationship. A missing person remains among us as so thoughts, memories, feelings, social relationships, etc. Although that no, although the body can be dismissed, the person will always stay with us because we are more than just our materiality. Disappearance cancels the body, and therefore the ties on daily life uncertainty between people. Disappearance, nevertheless, does not succeed in annulling uh, the person as a social being, despite despite ending their physical existence. What I understand, I like to understand this experience as something that this picture show us. I took this picture on my uh, during my field work 
And this picture is a really big stone plate on uh, uh, in Ayacucho, which is the region where I work uh, on this uh, organization called Anfasep, which is uh, the oldest and most important victims organization in Peru. And this uh, plate was given to Anfasep by the justice ministry when they turned uh, 34 years of organization. I think this appearance as what we can see on this uh, plate, we can see that there are some words so, and some letters. Some letters are in black and some letters are, or the black color is missing or already gone. But still we can know and we can see there are letters written there. Pro probably we can't read it clearly. We can tell specifically which letter it is, but still we have some clues that letters are still there, even though they are uncolored. So this appearance is exactly the same. Even though the person is missing and we can see this person and we can talk or we can interact with this person, we know that this person is gone. We know that this person exists, existed, sorry, and we have ties with this person. So this appearance is exactly like this plate. It has some clues, it leaves some clues, and it leaves, if you want to say like this, some holes on social relationships too. And I think this picture is really, really powerful to understand what I call the nobody or the nobody process. So uh, um, this appearance has special kind of victim, the missing person, but also, and what I want you to know, or what I want you to understand, and what I understand is that this opinion has other kind of victims too, what I call the uncertainty victims. What is this uncertainty victims? It's a, what I propose a new definition of victim, a new definition that goes beyond the profile bill, but by the CBR. What I mean with this is uh, profile different, they are not only men, they are not only between 20 and 40 years, they are not only victims of uh, killing or raping, etc. There's a new definition that goes beyond the CBR, but also that it goes beyond any legal definition. Under a uh, legal definition, a victim is someone whose rights have been violated. But what I propose is that this is not necessarily or entirely true because um, victims can also go through a recognition process. You can recognize yourself as a victim. Maybe in the 80s and 90s, you didn't recognize yourself as victims, but nowadays, 20 years later, you can recognize yourself as a victim. And this is what I call an uncertainty in victims. Why is a, what I mentioned a recognition process? Because recognition, because it started with a recognition of the missing person, everybody who's seeks for the relative is looking for a missing person. And initially they think that this missing person is the victim of some uh, crime. But when the time goes through, especially 20, uh, 20 or 40 years later, they start recognizing themselves also as certain kind of victim. Not only the person who is missing, but also you who is looking for this person, you are also a victim and you start recognizing yourself as a victim. Why? Because they, uh, they go through a learning process, especially a, uh, through the human rights movement, which was really strong during the 80s and the 90s and who has been strong, uh, especially between 2000 and 2010 here in Peru. Um, I, I want to make clear that, of course, I'm talking about certain kind of persons, especially these persons who actually are part of this organization what I, that I mentioned just before, and FACEP. They are not any kind of victim. Uh, I, I didn't have, I didn't research with any kind of, of or random victim. I, I made my, uh, and I did my research with this organization. Uh, it's a historical organization. It's a big organization. Uh, it has been part or a key part of the human rights movement in Peru. Also, it goes from that recognition process that I start on the individual experience yourself. You are looking for your, um, missing relative, but it goes to a collective experience. Why? Because you start going through Anfasep, you start 
you join Amphacep and you, are, you start looking for your missing relative, yeah, not only by yourself, but you start going through other persons who are also part of this organization. And eventually, especially during the 90s and the 2000, 2000 you start, uh, this uh, victim started having an active public role because when the violence decreased, they could speak louder and they could also interpolate uh, the public opinion on this uh, crisis of the missing person. So what I think is that the uh, uncertainty victims, they build citizenship from the margins of the state using this concept from uh, pool and dust. You know, they, they're moving forward and they're pushing forward the margins of the state in order to gain recognition and to gain citizenship. Even when the state um, it doesn't want to recognize themselves because as I mentioned before, they are poor people, they are campesinos, they have a language different from Spanish, etc. cetera. Um, I, if I get the time, uh, yeah. Okay, this is the organization I'm talking about and I, uh, which I researched um, last year, which is called Anfacep. And this is, uh, public demonstration they made during August, 2017. Uh, was just on the last day of my field work and they made this public demonstration on Ayacucho's uh, main square. Nowadays they can do it or they can do these kind of activities openly on the street. But during the nineties and the eighties, it was almost impossible to do this. Okay, now that we understand uh, how, uh, how the, uh, absence of race and the, on what the nobody eats is, I will try to show you these trajectories and techniques that I've been mentioning and that I was on, the, on my uh, summary for this presentation. Um, for this, I use this concept from Marcel Moss, which is uh, te techniques of the body. Uh, Marcel Moss tell us that by this expression, he, mean, he meant the ways in which from society to society, men know how to use their body. In any case, it's essential to move from a concrete to the abstract and not the other way around. I call technique an action which is effective and traditional. And you will see that in this, it is no different from magical, religious or symbolic action. It's the way we move, we express, or if you want to use it nowadays, how we perform our body, how we interact with the external world and how we create, uh, certainty, but we also create reality. But as Mo said, we perform this through our body. So what happens when the body is missing, when the actually the no body is operating? What I uh, propose is that you can also uh, find, or what I understand is like we can also talk about uh, no body techniques, like the body that has techniques learned and transmitted that allow us to understand the world around us. The no body has techniques to apprehend and understand the uncertainty of the bad death, what is called in the Andes, the mala suerte, mala muerte, sorry, which is our uh, different ways of dying that are not um, properly uh, or ritualized and they are not expected. For example, disappearance is what we, they call mala muerte or bad death. And disappearance in the absence of materiality. The techniques of the nobody go, oh, sorry, the, the typo there, follow two trajectories, the individual experience and the collective experience. And for each trajectory, I, can, I have uh, found certain techniques that operate there. The techniques of the low body are reshaping what victims understand about death. They start with a mandate that should be done. Everybody should look for the missing person, but this start changing through the years. As I said, more than 40 years have passed already. The techniques of our body are also reshaping identities because since uh, almost all the persons who look for their relative are women, there's a, uh, a strategic use of notions about maternity and what a woman or woman should do. 
And this is, this is really interesting because even though your um, brother is missing, even though your husband is missing, all women call themselves mama or mother. So there's a certain kind of identity there. Even though you are not a mother who is looking for a son, they start building themselves as mothers or mama. But also these techniques are reshaping recognition as I mentioned before, because they start looking and they start fighting for truth and justice. But we have to understand truth and justice in a wide spectrum. Truth, not only on where their family or their relative is or was disappeared, but also truth about who is the perpetrator of this kind of crime. And justice, we have to understand justice also in a, in a wide spectrum, not only as a criminal, as criminal justice, but justice also uh, re related to reparations and recognition. So it's a it's an, a complex idea of truth and justice, which is more complex than the idea the, that the public policy and the state has about these two concepts. So uh, now I, I will uh, show you these trajectories and um, techniques that I was talking about. Uh, okay, about the individual trajectory, they are looking for the materiality and they are communing with the dead. What I try to show you is that even though the uh, person is missing and the body is discharged or is missing, they are still communing with their loved one with the missing person. And I, I have uh, found three techniques on this trajectory. This, the first one is the individual search, which started immediately after the uh, disappearance. And this is, there is this mandate of caring and protecting. Why? Because again, they are women who are looking for their uh, loved ones. Another technique started on this individual trajectory is uh, what in Ayacucho is called the ofrenda, which can be translated as the gift. And it's a ritual that is performed on November the 1st, uh, the Dia de los Muertos, the uh, I don't know how to translate it properly, but the uh, death day or that, yeah, which is a, a day of remembrance of your missing person or your person who is actually dead, but since the, their relatives are missing, they try to remember and they try to act like their uh, relative is dead, even though they are not sure if their relative is dead. So they uh, perform this ritual called the ofrenda, which is like um, they perform like they were having a service to a dead person and they uh, put old clothes, they share food, they share drink and they stay awake all the night like a service if someone had just died. And with the ofrenda, which is on November the 1st, which is a really important day on uh, Andean society, they have all that kind of uh, religious practices with different kind of meaning. If you are Catholic, they also have like special mass, but if they are uh, evangelicals or Protestants, they also have different kind of uh, ritual and religious services. Like they, like if uh, the relative were dead, they try to uh, represent this, even though they are not sure or they, are, they, they just try to react it. And the other uh, technique that I have found is the dreams. Dreams are really powerful on Andean culture. Um, on Western societies, dreams are uh, what we can call uh, something about from your imagination. If you dream something, maybe you want to believe that it's predicting something on your future or maybe has some special meaning, but actually dreams, um, they don't build certain thing about your life and about the future. But on Andean culture, dreams build certainty about your life and uh, on the future. Dreams are really important in order to build truth. So uh, families and relatives, they dream with their uh, missing loved one and they can commune with them, they can talk with them, they can sh uh, share with them through dreams. And dreams are used to build certainty and truth. Um, a lot of women that I talk with, they mentioned me that through dreams, they knew and they discovered where the um, relative was buried or how the relative was um, 
kill, etc. Of course, with a, a Western mentality, you can be skeptic about it, but as an anthropologist, you have to be open to these other kind of uh, practices and other kind of ways of building truth and certainty. So dreams are also really, really important for uh, missing persons relatives. And on collective trajectories, we have other techniques. Uh, and these techniques are uh, related to intersubjectivity and building new bonds. First, the association to be part of Anfacep allow them to share, to have a shared experience. So, on uh, individual trajectory, they start looking for the relative um, by themselves through the organization and um, by being part of Anfacep, they start sharing the experience and they start knowing that the uh, violent experience of, of uh, disappearance. It's something that I share about a lot of different persons, and this is a shared experience, so they can um, share this active of, or this act of looking for someone too. So we have a collective share search. Sorry, we have a collective search, a mandate and a performance. A mandate of looking for someone, but also it turns into a performance, especially um, after 2000 when we recover democracy and with this and this kind of performances and manifestations were allowed and it was safe for them to be on public, to make demonstrations on public spaces, et cetera, et cetera. So they start looking uh, individually uh, in secret during nights. And nowadays as a collective territory, they are looking as a group and as, and as a consolidated group and they share this experience. And Finally, we have uh, what we call and what is called in the Andes Romeria, which is some kind of visits to uh, cemeteries, even though an or memorial spaces, uh, even though your relative, you know that it's not uh, buried there because your, uh, your loved one is still missing, you visit the cemetery as if he or she were buried there. So, uh, cemeteries and our uh, memorials turn into and they gain a new meaning for relatives and they appropriate or these spaces as um, new in new ways in order to make their statement and in order to share this experience of this collective trajectory. Um, am I good with the time? I think I'm almost done. Just to conclude, the uncertainty victims apprehend the violent experience of disappearance through a relationship between the materiality and the intersubjectivity, where two trajectories and at least six, six techniques can be found. In the process, the, uh, the uncertainty victims shape themselves as citizens and interpolate the state, pushing forward its margins and refusing to be dismissed. And FACEP shows us how the uncertainty of the nobody can be, feel, can be a field of innovation and, a, and creation of new political actors. Why? Because as I mentioned, these victims are not any kind of victim. They are as, they have a special role and they have a special voice in uh, the, at least in the human rights movement, but in Peruvian society as a whole too. And um, that was all. Thank you very much. You can follow me on the social media too if you have more questions further than this uh, presentation. Thank you. <laughs>